Chapter three, we're going to talk about burdens. Burdens on the property. Things that could make that property untransferable, right? If you have a piece of property that had a huge mortgage on it, you had a, um, you didn't pay your federal taxes and they put a lien on your property and it's more than those two liens itself, right? Um, you didn't pay your real estate taxes, you didn't pay your federal income taxes. All those liens together are more than what you could get from this property and more than what you got in the bank. Can you sell it? How much is a property's value that can't be sold? Zero, right? It's not worth anything. If you can't sell it, you can't transfer it, there's no value to it. So you're going to have to figure out a way. Well, all of these things we're going to talk about, these encumbrances, burdens on the property, are all things that could come up when you're trying to sell this property, okay? Trying to move it, even trying to use it in some cases, right? We were talking about earlier some um, easements that are on the property. If they're recorded, they're a pertinent. That means that they travel to the next owner until they're relieved, until we get rid of them. So those might, you know, they all come into play. I want you to understand something. All liens are encumbrances. All liens are encumbrances, but not all encumbrances are liens, okay? If we have a mortgage lien or we have an HOA lien or we have a real estate tax lien, all right, they're all encumbrances on that property. But if we have an easement, we have an encroachment, right? All those things, they're encumbrances also. They're burdens on the property, okay? So all liens are encumbrances, but not all encumbrances are liens. We also have easements and encroachments, right? And you notice there here in this little chart, even on the first slide, mortgages, HOA liens, real estate are financial. And then we have physical encumbrances, which are the use of the land. We're, maybe we're over the property line. Maybe we are. Um, we have an easement to use a road, things of that nature. All right, so the five different things we're gonna talk about a little bit, liens, deed restrictions, something called list pendants, L-I-S-P-E-N-D-E-N-S, -E -E easements and encroachments, okay? These are the five keys, all right? These are the five keys that we're gonna talk about under encumbrances. All right, so what's a lien? All right, this lien is not a debt, but it's their ability to sell your property to satisfy this debt. So if you don't pay your real estate taxes, what can they do? They can sell your property, right? If you don't pay your mortgage back, they can sell your property to get their money back. Um, let's see, so um, if you have a federal tax lien, can they sell everything you own in order to get their money back? Yeah, sure they can. They're looking for their money and any asset that you have, they can sell. State, anything else, a judgment lien, anything, all right? So all these things are not particularly to take your property. It's not a debt on your property. It's their ability to take your property, all right? It's your ability to take your property to satisfy that debt. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the definition by definition of, uh, of liens, right? And this is a claim of a creditor or a taxing authority against the real property, right? And they, that you've used for security. You took a mortgage out. What did you use for security? You used the property, right? So instead of them, so you just said, hey, yeah, I'll, I'll put up the property, okay? Um, if you bought a new car and you've got payments for the next six years, what happens if you don't pay it? They get to repossess the car, right? They're just going to take it back. You put that up. So you're using that as a um, as security for that particular item. Mortgages, HOA dues, right? Your HOA dues are a lien. By the way, if you don't pay them, they can put a lien on your property. And then ultimately, if it gets bad enough, sue you and then try to sell your property to somebody to make good for the debt, all right? Now, the next thing we're gonna talk about 
Deed restrictions, on the other hand, this is what you, does anybody live in an HOA community? Someone that has an HOA, someone has a property owners, right? We all have them. Some of you are lucky enough not to have them. But if they put restrictions on your property, you get a, uh, a what's called CCNRs, covenants, conditions, and restrictions. You signed that when you moved in. Said that, hey, guess what? I'm going to abide by these rules. That's a deed restriction. That's a deed restriction. If we have a condition subsequent, we just talked about it, um, a condition subsequent that says that I can't sell alcohol on this property. Is that a deed restriction? Yeah, right? That's a deed restriction. So we have that. Same thing with the determinable, right? If I change the, if I change the use of this property, I could lose it. That's a deed restriction. Okay. So all of those things. For property zone commercial, can I put a can I build a, a residential unit in there? No, that's a restriction, right? That's a restriction. So we have restrictions, right? So that is what a deed restriction is. Okay, so when we talk about, is everybody good so far? Deed restrictions, liens. Let's talk about liens and specifics. Give me um, give me an example of what you think an involuntary lien is. Ultimately, it could lead to foreclosure. Yeah, but a tax lien, right? Um, a tax lien, a judgment, a um, you know anything that somebody puts upon you, right? An HOA lien. What's a voluntary lien? What's a voluntary lien? Yeah, I would say a mechanics lien is more voluntary, but what's the bigger one? What's the bigger one? Yeah, there you go. The mortgage, right? The mortgage is a voluntary lien. You ask for it, right? So that's the difference. Involuntary is something that somebody puts upon you for being part of this community and part of the rules and regulations. And a voluntary lien is I hired a contractor to do work on my house. Now I need to pay him, right? If I don't pay him, he's going to file what? A mechanics lien. Mortgage. I asked for the mortgage. If I don't pay it, what are they going to do? I'm going to file a, they're going to file a mortgage lien, right? They're going to try to take the property. I asked for those. So that's the difference between involuntary and voluntary, all right? Involuntary and voluntary. Now, we also have a difference between general liens and specific liens. A specific lien, right, is a lien in... Um, uh, to lean in REM, don't worry about that. Um, specific lien, all right? This is attached to a specific piece of real estate, to the land, okay? Your deed of trust, which is your mortgage in North Carolina, okay? That's to the land. Your real estate property taxes, that's a specific lien. Your special assessments, if they pave your roads and it's not public roads, it's private roads, who's paying for the paving? Yeah, you, that's right, right? You get to pay for that. So that is a special assessment. Maybe they're gonna put sidewalks in. They're not covered by the, um, not covered by the community. They're gonna be paid out of the HOA. You're gonna get paid, you're gonna to have to pay a special assessment. That is a specific lien on your property. Mechanics liens we talked about, right? You gotta pay your contractor. And then if you're a commercial real estate broker, you can have a, um, you can file a lien, and we'll talk a little bit more about the, this. You can file a lien against your company, against a, a deal that you, just, um, that you just consummated. We'll talk more about that. Just hold that in the back of your mind. All right, hold that in the back of your mind. Now, we do have some rules about mechanics liens. Your contractors have to be paid, right? If you hire somebody to add a room to your house, they have the right to get paid, all right? So if they don't get paid, they can file a lien against you. Then go to the clerk of the, excuse me, go to the clerk of the court and they said, hey, I did work for Sam Hassel, um, I don't know, 100 days ago and I haven't gotten paid yet. I would like to get paid. So I file a lien. 
Now, I had to hire a contractor. I also had to hire an electrician. And I also had to hire a painter. And I didn't pay any of them. So I had some, one of them file in 100 days. I had another one file in 105 days. And I had another one file in 110 days. They all filed liens against me. Who's going to get paid first? If they foreclose on my house, somebody's going to get paid first. Who are they? Yeah, the and the Hunter, yeah, there you go, Tyler, right? You have to file within 120 days, but the first one to file is the first one to get paid. Second one to file, second one, third one to file, third one. Now, we'll get to it. I don't want to get ahead too far. So subcontractors, uh, architects, contractors, equipment lessors, anything that has to do with surveyors, anything that has to do with your property, those are our, you know, mechanics liens. They have to get paid. And they're going to get paid in the order they record, all right, in the order they record. Now, they have to be filed within 120 days from last furnishing of labor or materials. So I dropped off, I, I, I filed it 100 days, I dropped off the material 100 days ago, okay? That was the last time I furnished it. What's going to happen is, let's say I've been working on that job for 60 days. Well, if I file at 100 days, they're going to backdate that for 60 more days. And what will happen is that will be the start date, the date of the original delivery of the materials or the original work. So when you file at 100 days, they're going to go back and they're going to predate that from when you first started. So that will be the original start date. Okay. So. It has to be filed within 120 days from the last furnishing of labor or materials. And it takes effect from the first date of furnishing the labor or materials. All right. So you have to file it. I have to take them to court within 180 days of last furnishing. So I have to go to court. I have to file, file my court case within six months, 180 days of when I've last furnished materials. So usually it doesn't go to 100 days. Usually if I don't get paid in 30 days or 60 days, I'm going to file a lien. And then I'm going to work with the court to get to court so that I can take it to the judge. And I'll have the judge get my money for me. All right. So if we don't, if it's not foreclosed, this lien is going to remain in place until you, the property sells. And then when you sell the property, what happens with all the liens at the closing? Anybody know? All of these liens at the closing, what happens to all of them? Anybody want to take a guess? Um, actually, all of you are correct here. Some of them have to be, most of them will have to be satisfied by the seller. But if, if um, I don't, if I'm the buyer and something doesn't get settled, guess who now owns that lien? The new buyer. The new buyer owns the lien. That's why these things have to be settled at closing is because if I bought a house that had a me mechanics lien on it and they didn't satisfy it from the sellers at the uh, closing, when I bought the house, I bought the lien. Okay, that lien just didn't go away because he sold it. It has to be paid, right? So if we don't get them satisfied, so all we want the attorney to who's doing the closing to go through all of these things and make sure they've satisfied all of these liens, all right? But in the in some cases, if they don't, if they miss something, that lien's still on the house, all right? So, particularly a specific lien, a specific lien is still on the house. I bought it. Yeah. Guess what? Congratulations, Sam. You just gonna, you just bought a twenty thousand dollar lien in addition to paying five hundred thousand for the house. Good job. Who's your attorney? You pick the attorney, you idiot. Right? So that's on you. It's on me. You gotta make sure this stuff is closed out. Contractor has to bring it to court within 180 days. So they have to they, they have to go in front of the in front of that judge within 180 days of the last delivery of materials. So they gotta say, hey, and then the judge is gonna either order that paid or they're going to order a lien on that property until and they're going to give them x amount of time to pay it 
or if they sell it, they have to pay it. So any of those things, that's going to sit on the property. So if they go to sell it, right, the judge is probably going to make them pay it, even if they make them pay it in installments, or the judge could force a sale to pay it. If you're in real estate, you're going to be in front of the judge. You're going, it's real estate and judge, they, they're the only arbiter. They're the enforcers, right? We can't enforce anything, right? We don't have any rule. We don't have any rules. We don't have, I mean, we have rules, but we don't have any power of enforcement. We got to take it to the judge and let the judge do it. So we have right on our side, maybe, but again, they got to take care of it. So, um, and, and we, we have to go through there. So 180 days of last furnishing. Now, let's say it is a second home or it's an investment property or you own a commercial building and you had work done, okay? The North Carolina Mechanics Lien Law says that if you had work done that was worth over $30,000, you have to assign a lien agent. So basically, you're going to find an attorney that's going to work as a, a, a lien agent. And all of these people who are doing work on your property are going to file a lien immediately, a mechanics lien. And then you have to, um, so the vendors have to serve notice to the lien agent within 15 days of beginning work. So they're going to give all this information to this lien agent. And the lien agent is going to make sure each one of these people get paid. If they don't get paid, then the lien agent is going to take it to court and go to the clerk of the court and do it for you. So North Carolina Mechanics Lien Law says that if you are not, um, if you are a second home, investment property, commercial property, all right, the only exclusion to this is if it is an owner-occupied single-family detached property, your own house. If you're getting $50,000 worth of um, work done on your house, you don't have to file for a lien agent. But if it's your your second home or your investment property or a commercial property and it's over $30,000, you have to tell each and every vendor that you got to go file this lien with this lien agent. So even before the work starts, they all have liens on your property. And then as you pay them off, the lien will be clear. But that's what has to happen, all right, because of this. So anything more than $30,000, they have to, before 15 days of beginning the work, they have to um, take care of this. So let's say I'm going to, I own a, a shell of a building, and I want to put in a grocery store. But in order for me to do that, I have to have walls to put in, and I have to have racking, and I have to do electrics, and I have to have uh, um, you know refrigerators put in and everything else. So I know that that's going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars. So each and every one of those people, the architect, the, um, this, the, regardless, the refrigeration guy, the, um, the electrician, anybody who's doing work in there, before they even start the work, I'm going to tell them to go see Joe Schmo, attorney at law. He's going to act as a lien agent. And what they're going to do at Mr. Schmo's attorney's office is they are going to file an affidavit that says we are going to do X amount of work. We're going to start it on this day, and we expect to be paid this amount of money, each one of them. Okay. They come in and they do the work. Now, I'm saying, okay, this is all done. This is where I want it. Everything else is good. Yeah, an entire sub list, right? So what they're going to do now is I'm going to pay, I'm going to give that lien agent money to pay these vendors. And the lien agent is going to look at the first one who came in and said, okay, you get paid first. Okay, you get paid second. Okay, you get paid third. And that's it. Now, if I don't pay them, if I don't pay them and the project's complete, and the, the lien agent says, okay, you got to pay the bill. And I say to the lien agent, sorry, Mr. Schmo, I got no money left. Mr. Schmo is going to take all that stuff, all that documents that he's got, and he's going to bring it right to the clerk of the court. And he's going to take it to the clerk of the court. Now, these vendors don't have to do it again. They've already filed it beginning. 
They don't have to do it again. Mr. Our attorney, Mr. Schmo, is going to the court and say, hey, let's file these so that we get these people paid. So it'll all be in one place, one big document. Instead of 15 or 20 people going to the clerk of the court and filing on the same property, it'll just all be done in advance. Now, remember I said earlier that if you are a commercial real estate broker, you could file a lien in North Carolina also. I don't know if you're familiar with commercial real estate or not, but it could take a long time to do a deal in commercial real estate. Now, they're usually for a lot more money, but that all being said, they take forever. And from the time you're done putting a buyer and seller together, all right, um, from the time you're done putting the buyer and seller together, it could be months still before they close on this property. You still have to do due diligence. You still have to make sure you do, um, you know, they or they still have to do due diligence. They still have to come up with agreements. They still have some contracts they got to go through. They got to make sure they can do everything. So it could be months. But you're the real estate agent and you all your job is to put the buyer together with the seller and put them together. Well, I want to make sure I get paid, right? Three months from now, four months from now, you're going to forget that I was part of this deal. And usually each one of their own attorneys are going to draw, draw up papers. It's not like we're going to go to a buyer's attorney and they're going to draw them up. Everybody's going to have their own attorneys. So in that particular case, what I can do is file this lien with the clerk, right? So it says this lien puts it on a commercial property to be sold with a lease to protect the broker's commission. I just want to protect my commission. I want you to remember me in the end. Right? I did my job five months ago, put the buyer and seller together, but it took a little while. All right? So you do have to have an agency agreement. You do have to be finished with doing your job, right? Put them together, did all the other stuff. Now they're working on other due diligences and things of that nature. All right. Um, so in those that particular case, I want to make sure that we can um I can get paid. I don't want to be forgotten. And that's what a commercial real estate broker lien really is because of that gap in time between when we finish our job and when they close, all right? Um, so, and then it says here, a leasing broker has up to 90 days after the tenant possession to file the lien. Um, and when, if I'm a leasing broker and I do commercial properties, right? I wanna get paid. Um, I wanna get paid from the, uh, either the, I could be the tenant's agent, I could be the, the owner's agent, but I want to make sure that I get paid from the transaction. These are pretty big transactions. It could be millions of dollars, right? When you start doing this. So after the tenant possession, tenant takes possession, I want to make sure I get paid. Mr. Buyer, you owe me some, or Mr. Seller, you owe me some money. Mr. Landlord, in this particular case, you owe me some money. I want to get paid so I can file that lien, all right? That's what a commercial real estate lien is, and that's why we have to do it. So those are all specific liens to the property. Let's talk about general liens. General liens. This attaches to the person, all right? So this attaches to the person. These are, but again, these are judgments, personal property taxes, not real estate property taxes, but personal property taxes, state and federal taxes, okay? Now, they all have the ability to sell your property and your personal property to satisfy these judgments, these liens, okay? So these are general liens. They're not on the property. They are on the person, okay? They are on the person. Um, let's say you're out driving one day and you let your car insurance lapse for whatever reason, and you go out and wipe out a brand new $150,000 Mercedes. Nobody got hurt. But now you, this guy wants his car fixed and you got a no insurance. You got none. And now the judge is going to say, hey, Sam, you better pony up some money. And I got to say, I got no money. So the judge is going to say, well, I'll tell you what, you're going to start paying that money at 150 bucks a month for the next 100 months or whatever it's going to take for you to pay off this debt. A lot longer than 100 months, but whatever that is, whatever the numbers work out. Okay. That is a lien. That is a judgment against me. I am going to pay off that $150,000. Now, if I miss a payment, what can I do? 
They can start. They start with selling my car. They start with uh, you know anything I own. If I have a trailer in the yard, if I have whatever I got, they're going to start taking it away. Ultimately, when they get all of that, what are they going to come for? Everything but thirty thousand dollars in my house. Remember, we talked about the homestead exemption last week when we talked Thursday. We talked about homestead. Thirty thousand dollars in my house is protected. So they can come and get, get can get come and get up to thirty thousand dollars, and they have to remortgage and finance. It gets a lot more complicated than we need it to be, but they can come and get it right up to that, right? So that is what happens with these general liens. Effect of the liens on this title: liens are a pertinent. They run with the land. Remember what we said earlier: if we buy this property and we don't get those liens satisfied at the closing. We bought the lien too. We bought the lien too, all right? So, so a specific lien does not attach to the owner. The lien attaches to the property. General lien attaches to the owner, that's theirs. Specific lien attaches to the property. And those things have to be cleared. Those things have to be cleared. All right. All right. We talked about a lot of liens, but we didn't talk about priorities. Who gets paid first? I don't know. Who gets paid? We just shuffle them around? No, doesn't work that way. Number one, who gets paid first? The re your real estate taxes. They're going to call them ad valorem taxes according to value. Um, real estate taxes go first, and then immediately following any special assessments that you have. Okay, real estate taxes go first, special assessments go next, all right? Next, after that, so this is like one and one A, all right? Very, very close together. Second is mortgage in mortgages in order of recordation. If you recorded first, you're gonna be the first to pay. If you recorded second, you're gonna be second to pay. And we'll talk about subordinations when we start talking about mortgages down in a little bit, not today. Um, number three is going to be liens and judgments in order of recordation. Who recorded first? They're going to get paid first. Who recorded next? They're going to get paid next. And then the fourth one is mechanics liens, effective with the first uh, day of labor when they first met, started. So even if you're a mechanics lien and they have to go into foreclosure, you got to pay for the court. You got to pay for your real estate property, taxes, and special assessments. You got to pay for your mortgages next. And if there's any money left, your liens and judgments. And then if there's any money left, then the mechanics are going to get paid. Otherwise, I mean, you can see this is a pretty healthy list, right? Chances are getting down to that bottom is pretty remote. But it could happen. And that's why it's so important to file these liens first, because the first one to file is going to be the first one to get paid. So if you got five mechanics liens on your property, Maybe the first one gets paid, but the other four are going to be out. Um, yeah, probably your lawyers and accountants get paid first, but you know who truly gets paid first? Um, yes, mechanics are in order of recordation as well. Yes, absolutely. You know who truly gets paid first in seriousness? The clerk of the court. The court costs get paid first, and they can be pretty substantial. So we don't, they're not real estate costs, so they don't really fit into our testing. But in the real world, the master of equity is going to get paid first. They take their money off the top and then it falls into all of this stuff, right? So, um, but this is your priority of liens for purpose, for testing purposes, all right? Property taxes, number one, special assessments, very close, number two, mortgages, liens and judgments, mechanics liens, right? Um, mechanics are an order of recordation based on the first day of work, okay? So, just to be clear, if I file this on, um, let's say I started work on November 1st, and I filed it on December 14th, they're going to go back to the day I started work or the day, day I delivered it. So my, my lien will be dated November 1st, okay? So I first started the work. Then the next person comes whenever they started the work. Then they, but if they, if I filed first, I would be in first position, even if it was the same day, right? They would be after me. They would file after me. So that's why we do it. So, yes. All right. 
Short answer is from the first day of work, first position. Next one, and all on and from that. Okay. Okay. Deed restrictions. We talked a little bit about these before. I kind of gave you a little bit of a scenario. Private agreements enforced by private parties. These are your community uh, restrictive covenants, your HOA documents, your CCNRs, covenants and restrictions, right? You can't have commercial park, uh, the commercial vehicles parked in your property. You can't have horses on your property. All house front doors have to be painted brown and not red, whatever, okay? No trailers parked in your driveway. No garbage cans out before five o'clock at night. You know the drill, right? If you've ever lived in one of those commercial, uh, com com yeah, one of those communities, you know the drill, right? Those are deed restrictions. We talked about our condition subsequent. We talked about our um, the feasible, same thing. And these are usually imposed by the developer or the original owner. And again, purpose is to maintain the standards and the value. We want a level to maintain. We have to put rules into place, okay? Rules in place. Okay, list pendants, list pendants. If I was gonna file suit against somebody who hasn't paid me yet, if I went to the clerk of the court to file it today, would it come up tomorrow? No, the backlog is pretty long. It could be three, four months from now, right? So it could be longer than that. But let's say at least I filed it and I'm trying to get it in front of the court. So this is an active lawsuit. Once I file it, it's an active lawsuit, all right? That may affect the title of the property, all right? I'm gonna go list a house. And before I go list the house, I go, take a, I go to the clerk of the court and I say, I wanna see your list pendant. And you can do this online in a lot of counties too. I'm gonna to see your list pendants, L-I-S-P-E-N-D-E-N-S. I'm gonna make sure that the house I'm gonna go list and try to sell isn't gonna get foreclosed on in two months. Right? It would be good information for me to know because I'm going to work for six months or work until that's over. I'm going to spend a lot of my money and a lot of my time and everything else marketing. And then the bank is going to take it over and I'm going to be out the door after I spent all the money. Right? So this is something that I don't want to happen to me. I want to make sure. Same thing with a buyer. If I'm working with a buyer, I want to make sure I have enough time to close on this before they foreclose on me. And if I see that they're going to foreclose, I'm going to know the details. I'm going to make some phone calls, right? So I can go to the clerk of the court and find out if there are any list pendants out there, potential lawsuits, upcoming lawsuits, upcoming trial dates, all right? So this is a foreclosure suit, right? In case the owner sells during those proceedings. I don't want to be left out in the cold. And I don't want my buyer to be left out in the cold either, all right? So, or can we buy it and then just be subject to whatever comes out of it? So there are a few things to do, but this is, again, this is an encumbrance. This is an upcoming lawsuit, right? Very detailed, it's, uh, it's a must. All right. Now, when we attach it, remember that Mercedes Benz that we crashed and we got to pay for? Well, the judgment is called a writ of attachment, okay? A writ of attachment. So basically, they put a writ on our property, our personal property, on our house or whatever. All right. So this is for debt. They owe it to we owe it to somebody. OK, we have to pay it. So that's just what they call it. It's just a nomenclature. Um, basically, it is just it just says that in addition, this writ is a document that says that we have to pay this for that. All right. So all it is is just the attachment. And it doesn't count for a mortgage. Now, if we're going to, after a foreclosure sale, we're going to talk about deeds as we get on. But after a foreclosure sale, they're going to use a sheriff's deed or a trustee's deed in order to um, transfer that title. You're not going to get a quick claim deed. You're not going to get a bargain and sale deed. You're not going to get a general warranty deed or a special warranty deed. You're going to get a sheriff's deed. It says, hey, here you go. You just bought this out of foreclosure. We're not giving you any warranties. It's you. It's all you. Okay. So that's what you have here. Writs are writs of attachment. That's just the legal notice that says you can't sell this house without paying this off. And that's really what it is. Okay. So if we have an easement, we have use of a property. All right. North Carolina is easement by prescription is 20 years. 
20 years. We have to be able to use that piece of property continuously, openly, hostily for 20 years. Um, that's why it's so hard to take that uh, that um, easement by prescription and turn it into ownership because 20 years is a long time, right? And they have to not abandon it. They can't leave it. So let's say, in just using their example, if we're going to use that little piece of roadway for 20, for 20 years, if for two years I didn't use that little piece of property, maybe I was out of the country. It's got to be continuous. So that means that it's going to start all over again from when I came back in the country, right? If I can show that it wasn't used for two years, okay, then it would be, um, then I can start all over again and still go longer. But look, you gave them, if you didn't stop anybody in 20 years from using your property, it didn't bother you then, why is it going to start bothering you now, right? So that's why you need to, um, you know, hey, look. For a little bit of time, you somebody uses something, then you catch them and you say, hey, don't do this. Now, once you say don't do this, they no longer have an easement by prescription, right? They can't keep using it. They have to stop. Now they're trespassing. Um, let's say, let's you let's let's say that um I have a piece of property and I don't even have a um I don't have a neighbor. I have a piece of property, but it's on the waterfront, it's on the riverfront. And down by the end of my property is a beach, and it's a public beach, all right? And along the edge of my property is a trail that goes down from the parking lot across the street straight down to the beachfront. And that's where everybody parks over there and walks down along that trail, okay? And nobody ever said anything. And I, let's say that um, Tyler comes and buys the property buys my property. And then he goes out there and slaps a big old gate along that front way where people were walking and say, no, 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 you can't walk here anymore. The next person you hear from is gonna be the local gendarme. He's gonna come there and say, open that gate because they have an easement by prescription to walk down this property to get to that. And the court would probably agree with them. There's no other way to get there. You can't block it. So in that particular case, he's going to have to let them use it, right? So it depends on, you know, how long. Now, if it was just a week, that's one thing. But if it's over a period of years, the judge can make a decision and say there's no other way to get there. Sorry, Mr. Tyler, but you're, you're out of luck. And that's, you know, that's the way that's going to end. So the judge has a lot of power. You can't landlock somebody. Somebody has to have access to their property, right? Easements are pertinent if they're using it and you don't tell them to stop. And that's the big deal. The big deal is that you didn't tell them to stop for 20 years. Next time you, you, you're you out, and we're, we're going to talk a lot more about easements in a little bit, but um, well, maybe not even tonight, but we'll, we'll talk about some. Next time you're out and you know a big grassy area where you know that there are, unfortunately, homeless people live, right? I don't ever want to be homeless. I don't want any of you to ever be homeless. It's it's got to be an awful feeling. I've been blessed. The if you notice every couple of years or so, does everybody know what a bush hog is? What bush hogging is? So when they come in with their equipment and they just bush hog everything, they just flatten it out, clean it out, cut the tall grass, eliminate the saplings, do all of that other stuff. You notice that their first, yeah, bush hogging. You notice that their first priority in a lot of cases are where homeless people have made encampments. And a lot of that reason is because even if it's for three or four days, what does it make them do? If they're running a bush hog through there, what does it make them do? They got to move, right? They got to separate. Yeah. So they got to move. So once they move, they abandon the property, right? Exactly right. So they abandon this property. So now they can't say, well, I've lived here for 20 years and here's my little encampment. Well, no, last year or two years ago, we wiped this whole thing out. Everybody had to move. So you moved, right? You haven't been continuous. So therefore, nobody can lay claim to that lane, well, to that land under an easement by prescription. And that's a lot. It's, man, I don't ever want to be homeless. Let's put it that way. I don't know. God forbid somebody else has been, but, uh, you know, you're trying to find a place to live, but they also don't want to be giving away land either, you know, because somebody's been in there.
and it serves a dual purpose of cleaning the place up, really, right? So in a lot of cases, you'll see that where those people were. were. And when they bush hog all that stuff, you'll see all the stuff they left behind. It'll just be like torn asunder and won't be much because there, you know, there really isn't anything and they, they're taking as much as they can, but garbage usually tore up. So um, yeah, so that's, there's a little, there's a secondary reason behind just cleaning that up which, you know, the first reason is they want to, you know, just take their, like, grass down and whatnot. But secondarily is they want people to move. And then come back, but move so they don't stay there. So those are all important. All right, so we have two types of easements, all right? Now, no ownership. No ownership. Nobody has ownership. They just have the right to use it. So we have an easement appurtenant. An easement appurtenant is recorded, and it runs with the land. If it's recorded, it runs with the land. Okay, now if it is an unrecorded easement, can you stop it? Now, if it's landlocked, you can't stop it. You cannot landlock anybody, but because they can got to go to court and say I have no other way to get into my property, you got to let me in, right? Um, yeah, there you go. Had to have my back acre bush hog after surveying. Yeah, they'll lay it out and then they trim it all down. Yeah, absolutely. So if I am landlocked and I have trees all around me and the only way to get in is across the back of your property, even if you put a big fence up there, if it was never recorded, I'm gonna to go to the court and I'm gonna say, hey, I can't get into my property. They just put a fence up. Can I have them take it down? Well, I'm gonna have it taken down and what's the first thing I'm gonna do? We're gonna record the easement so they can't do it again, right? The judge is gonna make them record it. But let's say it's between two families, right? Two families. And there's a pond in the back of my land. And you want to cross across the back to, uh, technically the pond is on the back of your land, but in order to get there, you got to cross across, uh, across the corner of mine. So over years, I just said, yeah, go ahead, use it. So what? And then I sell the property. I don't ever record the, uh, record the easement. Let's say it's only 10 years. New owner comes in, throws up a gate. I never recorded it. So now what happens is the new owner comes in and says, I'm not letting you use it. Sorry. They can stop it. Yeah, absolutely. They can stop it. It's not recorded. And that's why they want easements recorded. Because once it's recorded as a recorded easement, that means it's a pertinent, means it runs with the land. Okay. But if it's just a handshake agreement, it can be stopped. It can be stopped. Right. Now, we talk about two different parties of this. We have a dominant and a servient. But before we get there, we'll talk, we're going to start talking about them, but we're going to pick up again when we come back. But understand that if you have a road on your property and the street company wants to come and repave it or fix potholes, or the power company wants to come and fix the lights on your street or anything else, they have what's called an easement in gross, right? They can come and do it. All right, they got to fix the stuff. And they can, those last for a long time, right? How often do you, does a guy have to change the light bulb on your street post, right? I mean, maybe once every 20 years, 10 years, right? So they last a long time regardless. So they're going to have that easement to be able to do it. Some properties have, um, um, some properties have sewer lines that run across. Some have electric uh, high tension wires that have to get fixed. Some have other types of, uh, other types of things that go on there. And, um, you know, we can, we can make all kinds of things where they never, they never go to another person's property. It's just your property. They use it, right? They use it. So that is an easement in gross. Most times we're going to be using an easement appurtenant, which is a servient tenement and a dominant tenement. Think about it. A servient tenement does what? They serve. So that means I'm going to let somebody use my land, right? And a dominant tenement does what? I'm going to take, I'm going to use a piece of the other guy's land. I have to. I'm going to use it. So the dominant tenement benefits from it. The servient tenement is the one who's letting them use it. That's where that property goes, all right? So an easement appurtenant runs with the land, all right? and last forever, unless we physically go in and say we're not using it anymore and get it written out of the record, all right? 
These are two different lots with different with a, um, different owners, two adjacent lots. You cannot landlock anybody, okay? Now, when we say this is a pertinent, it is a pertinent to both lots. Pertinent to the Serbian tenement who says I have to let them use it, a pertinent to the dominant tenement who says I have to come that way to use it. I'm allowed to use it, okay? So dominant and servient. All right. So an easement has to be recorded to be binding against the purchaser of the serving the state, much like we just said. If we didn't record it, we stop it. We can stop it, right? This is an easement appurtenant. But if it's not recorded, it doesn't necessarily run with the land. If you like this video, feel free to share it with a friend. For more real estate education content, please subscribe to the channel. From all of us at Seacoast Real Estate Academy, thank you for watching.